Good day, my name is Mershin Pillay and welcome to the webinar that I'm going to be putting the title on for shortly. Give me a second, I'm going to share my screen with you and here it is. Um, while I'm doing that, I'd like for you to uh, take out your telephones or uh, if you have them with you. And uh, as, you, as you may recall, you've got a task that you had to do a pre-webinar task. And here's the slides. Okay, and I'd like for you to um, put in the menti.com code. So this is my title. It's a community-based approach to diet modifications in vulnerable contexts. They are my affiliations, uh, and that's my Twitter handle and my email address. Um, so that was your pre-webinar task. If you look at the chat somewhere down there on this side or down there, I'm not sure where, you will see a, a number that you should be able to put into when you go to the menti.com website and complete the task that by now you should have prepared for, for the webinar. So let's hope in, uh, you have done this and I'm really looking forward to uh, listening to your answers to those two questions that you see on the screen. So this is, this is the core learning objective that I'm hoping we engage in the next 45 minutes or so. We're we'll looking at our experiences that we have um, developed in um, working with ITSI at a community level. And, and I'd really love your thoughts, your views on implementing ITSI at a community level and, if you, uh, and what you think about the education program and its components. And also if you've got any other experiences of doing something similar, I'd love for you to share that. Those are uh, my, the disclosures that I have. The only thing that I am disclosing at the, uh, that, or that's relevant to disclose is that I'm a board member of ITSI. And Sydney to Sao Paulo, Paris to Mumbai or Bombay, uh, New York to Cape Town. These cover a wide context across the world. And I'd love to know a little bit more about you and where you're from. Are you from any of those places? Tell us a bit about your name or put your name in the chat, uh, write your occupation, uh, your location where you are currently, and uh, possibly if it's an optional um, statement about your country of origin. Okay, so while you're doing that, I'm going to go into the thing that we adore. Look at these images. I mean, this stuff is what we know enough about as dysphagia practitioners. We, we love doing instrumental assessments. We really enjoy looking at these images, endoscopic images down there, or the uh, visual fluoroscopic images, as you can see there. So that's really our knowledge base. We know a fair amount about the anatomy, the uh, pathophysiology of the swallow, how to deal with that at that level. So objects of our affection is that thing we call the swallow, love it. But now we've also got another object. And so we've got two objects, the objects of our infection, when we, uh, affection, sorry, maybe it is infection, is when we're looking at uh, things around uh, the way uh, we, we modify foods, then food becomes the, the core focus of what we do. So food is the focus of our work in addition to the swallow. And we're looking at diet modifications. What does this mean? We know that it's really critical to look at diet modifications because we know it literally saves people's lives. So if you can see in the slide, and sadly, there's, there's, there's a person as young as nine months old and someone as old as 95 and a whole range of different people in between from across the world who've all died of, by choking because of the wrong size of foods, the wrong textures that they were, they were eating, et cetera. And so we know that diet modifications makes a difference. And that's when ITSI was developed and why it's developed, why it's such a, a good thing to have is because of the, the reasons that are on this slide here, because it allows us to have this common terminology. And as we declare with ITSI, it's meant to be a common terminology for all ages, all care settings and all cultures. And boom, that's the thing that I would like for us to have a look at. So what about looking at all care settings and all cultures. Those are the things that I really am interested in because as ITSI, is it something we do well? Now I'm gonna distract just a little bit by um, going through a little bit of a story time here. So there's uh, a story I'm gonna to speak to and um, upfront credit to shutterstock.com here because I uh, used their images. I did register and use them for the slides, for these slides. 
And so this is a story that's set in a perfect world. And in this perfect world, it's a perfect hospital with perfect medical and health and rehabilitation staff and perfect people, like this patient you see here who's coughing away in the hospital. And because this is a perfect world and a perfect hospital, they've got super <laughs> speechy. And super speechy knows exactly what to do for a person who's coughing and eating. So super speechy comes to the rescue. And, but super speech is a little distraught because she's not quite sure the person needs to eat, but not quite sure how to manage the aspiration events. So what does super speech do? She thinks about this really hard and hard and hard and still has very little clue about exactly what to do with the foods because this person seems to think that a soft diet or puree might work, but they're not sure. And boom, out of nowhere appears super banana. And super banana says, I'm here to the rescue, me, 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 me. I'll be the person that, that you need to smash, so smash me. This, of course, makes super speechy very, very happy, and it removes her level of, just, um, uh, of unhappiness and, and makes her all happy. But this happiness is short-lived because loads of questions later. What does she do? Does it soft and bite size? Is it minced and moist? Is it puree? How to manage the banana? Super speechy to the rescue again. There's the Etsy framework. So super speech is now happy again because she has something to use. But again, super speech knows that she's living in this perfect world. And all she does is peep outside of this perfect world. And lo and behold, she can see thousands of people. No problems here, see super speech, all these coughing problems and aspiration events because of dysphagia. The super speechy realizes that there's too few species and too many people in the world. So all these people coughing and choking, not only do they exist with the dysphagia, but there's also no food. There's not even bananas to give them. So she starts looking at things like the sustainable development goals and thinks, oh my goodness, how are we ever going to get to a zero hunger situation when we have people with dysphagia who can't even eat properly? So she's seen all of these things, these people with the, the, the coughing and the dysphagia and the large numbers of people that they need to get to. And she goes, well, they can't all go to the hospital, can they? Because going to the hospital is a bit like going to the mountain because it doesn't exist or it's too far away. So super speechy is super distraught. And so she thinks about what to do, hospital, and suddenly she sees all of these inequalities in the world and she is fraught with anxiety. So all these people, not only are they there with dysphagia, there's about 60% of the 1 billion people in the world who are with disabilities who may have some kind of dysphagia. And there they are, not only are these people with disabilities in the world um, without, uh, with this problem, but they also live in parts of the world, in low middle income contexts, where food security or getting access to foods is actually a huge big problem. So super speechy because he, he is super smart. So he's this huge divide in the genie coefficient tells her that there's a big gap between the world's rich and the world's poor. <laughs> says again world i'm going to go right to where it's needed and super speech she goes to the communities and she goes to the mountain and she delivers speech therapy and all people with dysphagia live happily ever after so but if you go to community with itsy and we want people with swallowing disorders to live happily ever after and we've got all of these global inequities in the world especially something that, as you can see down there, that ugly little virus has managed to highlight. All COVID did was show us the, the gaps and the difficulties with regards to um, healthcare services and so on. And so the question is, does ITSI have a role? Does ITSI have a role in actually addressing these issues around global inequalities? And that's something we're going to be talking about. So moving on. Here's what I'm going to highlight. So the question is, we've got Etsy, and Etsy has this big little I in the beginning. And the I in the beginning, as we know, stands for international. So is Etsy international? Is it really for everyone? And is it applicable across the world, across content? And please note that I'm focusing on context and country. So is it applicable across low, middle income, and high income contexts and countries? So there's a couple of assumptions or a few assumptions that you see listed in the slide that, that ITSI might uh, 
that, that's built into the way Etsy has been designed. And so I must um, declare up front that this is my interpretation of these assumptions, but let me put it out there for you to consider. So some of these things that we have are, for example, that when we talk about thickening liquids like water, for example, classically, we speak about the use of a commercial thickener for liquids. Um, of course, we make reference to things like naturally thickened liquids as an option, but we also know how difficult that is to not only obtain, but also understand in terms of and classi classify, which is why, of course, it's a, it's a great system to use to classify a variety of naturally thickened liquids. But then we also assume other things like that there may be pre-made or commercial, commercial foods. So for example, we might and even link this into kitchen and catering services. We might look at um, things like the use of the syringe. And when we, we prescribe or ask people to use the uh, ITSI flow test, what about the availability of that perfect syringe, uh, the right kind of girth and the right kind of catheter tip, et cetera, to actually manage the flow in the way it was intended. So these are just a few of the things that, that, that I've been given thought to over the years of working with Etsy. And essentially what we assume when we're looking at stuff like this is that we can talk about diet modifications and classifications in context of the fact that we assume there's sufficient human resources, there's adequate healthcare systems, and of course that everyone's all hunky-dory and happy and they each and every person that we work with has food, is food secure or they're food mm -hmm. sovereign. And we know that's not the truth, okay? So when we think about ITSI internationally, what we do is that we need to really rethink about the way in which the world and its huge inequities can be seen through something as simple and as small as diet modifications and classifications for its complexity and its contextual relevance. Because the, these are the things that ITSI will, will make us see more. And the question is, do we replicate the system that was actually fits um, a more perfect world, a bit like the one that Super mm -hmm. Speechy lives in? Or do we start looking at different ways of implementing what is a global initiative locally? In other words, do we go local? And if so, do we go community? And if we go community, then if you look at this wonderful CBR, community-based rehabilitation matrix, which is from the World Health Organization and something that we've been using for quite a few years uh, in my places of work, um, then we begin to see that there's a lot of um, fairly complex issues that one needs to, to address when working or going toward a community, including things around health promotion, prevention, looking at broader issues like livelihoods and empowerment and all these fancy schmancy things like advocacy or advocacy, as people may say. So when you start looking at all of these things, can the wee, tiny, humble ITSI framework that speaks only of classification and diet modifications, can that be used in relation to a community-based rehabilitation framework as complex as that? Of course, you, must, you might by now understand that I'm saying, yes, it will. And so, but, but what I, I'm wanting to emphasize is, is the rationale, the why we go to community and why it makes sense. And it does make sense because of those two factors in the middle, where you're looking at the f that most of the people wouldn't uh, with, with swallowing disorders who happen to incidentally live in low middle income contexts in the world. So most people with disabilities live in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and most people with, uh, of those people with disabilities, we know that a fair percentage of them, we don't know exactly how many in economically developing countries or the majority world are with dysphagia, but we know it's a significant percentage. And so when you're looking at um, addressing issues of the majority world, and the majority world here refers to countries in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, and the Caribbean, and also refers to people who live in high income countries like uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, North American countries, Canada and the US, uh, where black, indigenous and or other ethnic minorities uh, uh, share very similar experiences to what underserved countries uh, or the majority world countries who are lower middle income um, also share. So we're looking at basically going to all those people okay and looking at shifting the focus on food and modi modifications but that, that are contextually relevant and so what i'm going to do is talk about why that makes sense okay and i also want you to to come into the story with me now some more 
go back to that Mentimeter with the same code that you've got on the screen or on the chat somewhere down there or somewhere down there and rate your knowledge focus. So how well do you know those five areas? Rate it and I look forward to seeing the results of that. And because this is a recorded webinar, I'm not really going to know what you say, but I'm assuming that you're going to say that the object of our affection, uh, the thing we love swallowing and associated notion, the associated notion of swallowing disability is what you know most about. So these are some of the things that we know a lot about. That's our traditional knowledge skill set. But what's novel and what we don't know enough about is the notion of food. We work with food. We work with diet modifications. We work with diet modifications and classifying the diet modifications. But do we know enough about food and food texture, et cetera? Question mark. We don't know enough if you're going to be shifting into a community. What, do we, what does it mean to work with community? Who is community and how do you engage community? And of course, the big issue of disability, because and I really want to focus on this and, 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 and maybe just reflect for a second or two on why it is we persist in using the medicalized notion of dysphagia for an issue that actually is a disability and something that people live with chronically. So the whole notion of community, of, of the notion of disability and the notion of food are things we really need to amp up a bit if we're going to be shifting into a community-based framework. Um, so, and so that's why when you're looking at those three issues at the bottom, for example, disability, poverty, and all of these other things, that's the stuff that confuzzles us. That's really what we don't know enough about. We engage, okay, but when we're shifting into a community-based framework, that's really what we need to be expert on. So this is something to think a little bit more about is that if we go into all these issues and we need to foreground the whole notion of food and food sovereignty and disability, et cetera, then we need to develop expertness in this. And in doing so, here are some of the, the frameworks, or at least the first framework that I'm going to cross-reference. It's something myself and a colleague, Harsha Katha, developed a few years ago. We referred to it as EPIC. We thought it'd be a cute title for something uh, that refers to issues of equity. So it's equitable population-based innovations for communication and swallowing, but we, we couldn't do EPICs, it just didn't sound right. So there's what this is. And it's premised on this notion of what we refer to as a decolonizing critical science. There's a reference um, and you're welcome to have a look at that. And um, you will be getting a reference list um, in your, uh, in, um, as part of the, the handouts for this webinar. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Thrive that's connected to EPIC, yet another acronym, love my acronyms, and Thrive stands for, for so first of all, it's set in this place here, well, this is one of the sites that we went to, it's in Zululand, uh, which is in the kingdom of KwaZulu-Natal, and that's what it looks like, and here's a couple of figures around um, Zululand and its population, its gender, spread education, literacy, poverty, and unemployment, etc. So it's a really low, it's a low end of low income in, uh, in a country like South Africa. And that's what THRIVE stands for. It stands for tackling hunger and, with, or via research and innovation uh, with, or within, or with vulnerable environments. So THRIVE is essentially um, a framework and it's a way of thinking around how we might work um, for, with people who have swallowing disabilities at a community level. And that's when these components come into play a bit more. So when we're looking at diet modifications and classifications, and while it's only this thing in the bottom left-hand corner here, the other three bits, food production, food preparation, and let's see if I get this right, primary care management of people with swallowing disorders, they're all important. It's equally important to focus on those aspects. I don't have enough time to talk about that right now, but what I'm going to do is share with you the next um, bit about the training program. And in terms of focusing on the training program, here are some of the elements that are important to consider. But I just want to share with you beginning of the beginning of this training program, why we did it or the historical relevance for this because of the country that this was developed in. So in South Africa, contextually, historically, we were a colonized country. We developed or went through many years of a, a racist government, an apartheid government. And then in, post, in a post-1994 world, we entered a democracy um, for the first time headed by Nelson Mandela as a country. And at that point in time, 
uh, was before 1994, actually about the late 1990s, we were involved in developing community-based rehabilitation programs for these reasons, because of the inequities that exist in the country. And so the very first program that, that, that I was involved in was in 1992, looking at developing programs for rehabilitation, including, of course, speech therapy services. So this is the, the sort of framework and the memory that I have that informs my work with um, within working in, at a community-based level for diet modifications, et cetera. So a lot of that thinking influences not just um, why we need to do it, but we, how and with whom we work. So uh, first of all, with the training program, um, um, looking at doing an ITSI community-based framework, a train-the-trainer framework is something that's critical. I'm not going to go through all of the professions that are listed here. Um, as you can see, there's a wide variety of types of people, from students and educators, and researchers, a whole range of professions, uh, all of whom came from various health fields, education, both at the secondary or school level and higher education and from a variety of social, civic, and even the food sectors. And this, um, this is not something that happened all at once. It's, these are people that are involved over time in developing this program. So that's something to take into account is who's involved and how. One of the key things around how we developed our training program was to focus on using principles of adult education, andragogy. And so having positioned the why and the how and the who, because all of these are really critical to the way we present this training program, let me share with you just a snapshot, a 60 second video of an example of one of the training programs that we were involved in. They do get pneumonia, then it's going to lead to something called secretion. For many persons who are not a Cuba, a Cuba says a lot of us. We will see the same as we are coming to the base most of the time. So as you can see in this video, just as a quick snapshot, really whirlwind tour of, of what we did at one event. And there was a, a day long training uh, that allowed for uh, a total of now about 90 odd uh, community health workers uh, to receive a certificate at the end of the day that showed that they were able to manage people with swallowing disabilities and focused on diet modifications and classifications. Uh, and there were a whole load of partners, as I mentioned, involved in that. And why this is uh, a background for, for me to share with you is because, again, just to drive home the point that when we're looking at um, textual measurement and classification, it cannot be done in a community-based, in abstraction from looking at things like food production, food preparation, and other issues around primary care management. And of course, I'm limited in this talk, and I'd love to share with you more about the other aspects, but let's just go a little bit more into what we did in the community-based training program regarding the, the so-called syllabus, so what, we, what are some of the content areas we, we, we shared with people around diet modifications and classification. And here's a very important thing, and, and as you know, if you go through the ITSI website, you will see recipes, you will see a whole range of literature around textural properties and rheology in general, and, and all of those factors. Um, and so what that meant for us at a community level was fluffing it up a bit more, because the, the main aim in looking at working within an andragogy framework is to give people, especially in low middle income contexts, enough knowledge on what it is to, to do or to, to engage diet modifications um, and to eventually classify foods that are made um, within the right prescribed texture or um, liquid level. And so that's, that was quite a big focus, is looking at uh, textual properties and sharing that knowledge with, uh, with the people we uh, engage in the training sessions. And then there's another big issue, which I'm pretty sure isn't 
is, is probably more of a concern for a low middle income country or low middle income context. And here it's the fact that um, food thickness, commercial food, thick, food thickness are really available. Um, for example, there's one or maybe two brands of food thickeners and it's only been recently available. I know that a major food thickening company pulled out of sub-Saharan Africa, not even just um, the country, South Africa, but the whole of the region because they thought it wasn't a viable market to sell the uh, modified cornstarch uh, or the uh, modified cornstarch mix. Uh, and so the idea is that when we're looking at advising people, if someone meets you and they say, hey, listen, you know, um, thank you for coming to see me. I've got a swallowing dis disorder. Here's um, what I think you need to do, thicken the water, thicken the liquid. This person's going to ask, well, what do I use? And if you don't have any food thickener, commercial one to thicken, what do you do then? So we've been experimenting with a variety of different corn um, starches, potato um, powders or potato thickeners, uh, potato as a thickener, rice flour, taro, and what I would call agar agar or agar is how I think it's known in, in, in Western Englishes. And um, there's also a whole range of other uh, focal areas we looked at, including food preparation methods. So we think that um, focusing on food preparation is a critical aspect because um, mostly people at the home level, at community level, school, at a hospital, uh, or not just a facility level, but more importantly, at the level of the home, people will be doing it themselves. And you'll notice that we experimented with quite a few things. I'll talk a little bit more about the uh, methods like aeration and dehydration and hydrocolloids purification, which we experimented with from um, high-end molecular gastronomy. But also just to emphasize that whatever we used needed to be cheap. So we needed to look at the economics, food economics and health economics of the situation, but also that it was relatively easy so saying to someone, here, go blenderize or liquidize your food is pretty useless if there's no electricity or no blender. So we needed to look at, at cheap um, uh, equipment, so things like forks and whisks and handheld um, or devices that, we could, that could be used that are relatively cheap and relatively easy to, um, to obtain. So those are some of the things that we would, would, would focus on when looking at training health workers and mainly looking, and not just health workers, sorry, anyone, siblings, caregivers of all sorts. Um, it's focusing on the food and what you do with the food and how you think about it in terms of its rheological properties and, and of course, how you, you make the food. And then the second major aspect was food, but food from production to consumption. And, and this is where it's a little bit different with uh, the mainstream Etsy implementation. You don't actually go and tell people to grow their own foods, do you? Right? Whereas at a community level, we encourage in this, and it's a component of the Etsy implementation, is looking and designing home gardens. So we have a program that we piggybacked onto. It's called it's a national program, and it's called One Home, One Garden. And it's looking at how we can co-design gardens with people, families of uh, people with disabilities, um, and to look at how we can get foods that are dysphagia friendly grown in them. By dysphagia friendly, I mean foods, for example, if we tell people to grow a particular type of sweet potato or, or type of spinach, uh, we've got to make sure that at, uh, when it is cooked, that the water or the liquid doesn't seep from the flesh or the fiber of the sweet potato, or that the spinach isn't too stringy, et cetera. So thinking about that garden, designing that garden is, is critical. Uh, and of course, when we're looking at uh, low middle income context, there's no point in issuing a diet prescription for a single individual, in other words, the person with the dysphagia, because guess what? It's a whole family that's food insecure. It, you know, the whole communities live in food insecurity or food who are not food sovereign. So the, the main concept uh, driving food production here is to ensure that it makes sense for the family, okay? And uh, then there's another key component around outside out of the consideration of the co-design of gardens that look at dysphagia friendly foods. We're also looking at indigenized or indigenizing foods. So there's no point in, of course, prescribing foods that are uh, perhaps maybe from a Eurocentric or Western background. And this, of course, will differ in your context. Um, but looking at the right kind of foods that people enjoy eating. Um, and then the third concept, um, which is meant to be indented the other way, but I'll just list it there, is the whole thing of pharmacy farms. 
And so when looking at gardens that make foods for people through production, um, looking at how they fit into the potential to be dysphagia friendly and um, the fact that they need to be indigenous foods, another key aspect is looking at foods that heal or the notion of pharmacy farms might be something to consider. And that's entirely up to how communities imagine what foods do in or understand foods or studied foods in terms of their ability to heal for a variety of reasons. Um, that's very specific to communities and various cultures. Uh, just a, a little bit here around the food preparation aspect that I made reference to, and I'm not going to go through all of the detail that's on this slide, other than to say that we really started looking at the science that mattered that came out of Western European, uh, North American contexts, because there were some pretty exciting things happening in, in gastronomical sciences, like, for example, molecular gastronomy. And so in 2016, we developed, we took maize, which is a commonly eaten, uh, it's a staple in, in South Africa, and developed um, these gels and made gels that were, uh, we used agar agar and developed a sphere that was a jelly outside with a liquid center, which was the, the maize. And we experimented with that as a, as a way of modifying foods for people with, uh, with dysphagia in community. Uh, we also developed a whole range of methodologies and Maralise de Villiers, who um, um, was a master student at the time, took this project on, uh, looking at developing purees and a whole range of other foods via altering methods. So the, the investigation was mainly around methodology. So things like aeration using forks and whisks and a whole range of other methods. We also transitioned into looking at transitional foods. So we looked at a fortified biscuit, which we developed in 2020, which was basically a dehydrated biscuit that was made from a product um, called EPUP. And they're also one of our partners um, in, in, um, in, in Zululand, where we looked at it as a maize in millet product. Uh, we developed and uh, dehydrated it to, uh, so that when, when it was bitten into, it, it became a puree on contact with heat and saliva. Uh, and then, of course, we, we started focusing on other things, um, and I'll take, talk a little bit about multisensory eating and food textual acoustics, and there's a study that Tasneem Karani has recently published on that, and I'll share that with you in the reference list as well. And so this, this, the science that this led to, and what happened when we looked at making all of these modifications and so on, is from community to laboratory, we developed a different lens for looking at how we modify and classify foods within an ITSI framework. So we looked at, we, we focused a bit more on multisensory eating, primarily because there's too few of us and too many people with dysphagia. So that investing in the food and hopefully the food that gets to their mouths could be something that in and of itself may be therapeutic. So investing in the senses, looking at multisensory eating was a big thing, is a big thing for me right now. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in, at, the, at this moment in looking at food textual acoustics, um, which basically looks at the close association between texture and the sounds that are made during biting and eating um, and how that may help us cue um, our, and, and how our swallowing system might respond to those sorts of cues uh, with more effortful bite and probably more of an effortful swallow. We're still developing the evidence around that. And I'll be happy to share that information with you as when we 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 come up with answers around that. Um, and then, of course, the emphasis within diet modifications for us is a little bit more on food production and preparation. So instead of looking at the classification end of things only, we are enhancing ITSI at community level to focus a fair amount on how do you make foods that are going to be useful for a person with dysphagia and how do you prepare them? And, and this leads naturally to what you've seen here as uh, and what I'm referring to broadly as decolonizing approaches, which takes into account issues of food sovereignty. The reality is that most of the world, I mean, so the, virtually most of the world, most of the people in the world uh, who live in low middle income countries, in other words, the majority world, are um, going to experience uh, some level of food um, sovereignty issue, food insecurity. And we need to remember this and address this. Um, I'm particularly keen on developing diet modifications within what I'm referring to as an inclusive eating framework. So remembering that people with disabilities and specifically people with swallowing disabilities need to be catered for literally, quite literally, when designing foods, when thinking about diet modifications, etc. And of course, then there's the issue of 
when you start looking at data modifications and classifications this way, you, you have to, there's absolutely no way you can divorce your brain from the context in which this thinking occurs, so a contextualized form of thinking. And again, there's some um, very interesting research coming out from a PhD student of mine, Thiani Pele, also Pele, uh, looking at contextualizing the way we think about dysphagia practice. But for me, by and large, the biggest difference that this has made for me at a community level is a humanizing focus on diet modifications. We tend to think about diet modifications in the way scientists have for a long time via its laboratory applications. We think about food modifications through a rheological lens, through a textural analysis lens. But there are people that are attached to food. There are people that are engaging in the food. Humanizing food modifications is humanizing food modifications is a huge thing that we need to take into account when we're looking at food and we're looking at diet, dysphagia diet modifications. Because if we're really um, wanting to take this seriously, then instead of focusing on the diet modifications, looking at food as a fundamental human right, that's the thing to deal with. And so uh, in that last slide, I'm just gonna share with you all of my thanks here to the people that were involved in, in Thrive in the past over the, over the years that we've been doing this. The, I'm not gonna read out their names, but there they are. And there's a whole lot of other people um, who I did not knowingly leave out but there's definitely a whole host of others that are involved in Thrive. Um, and these are my contact, that's my email address. And I look forward to engaging you in any conversation that we, uh, we may have around ITC and ITC modifications. And I'm really um, hoping that you connect with me and then we have further conversations around the topic. Okay, so we on after the presentation, I, I must share with you that that was a recorded presentation. So and I and having listening to some parts, I apologize in advance for the difficulties experienced in in some of the recordings. Okay, am I showing you my main screen? Uh, okay, sorry, I think I just need to show something else. Okay, so these are the results of what came through on the menti.com review, looking at issues of, of what you're concerned about or the things that, that mainly as this group of um, attendees in the seminar are focused on and what you know more about. Swallowing, I think, was part, uh, partly what we assumed would come up strong, as well as disability, and then food followed by poverty, and then finally social and cultural issues. So in terms of shifting to a community-based framework and looking at how we implement ITSI, as you can see, for me, it almost needs to be a, um, the other way around, looking at five, four, three in that order um, as being the, the dominant knowledges that we need to, to own when we shift ITSI into community. Um, what I'm going to do at this point is ask uh, for those of you who are on the call right now on the webinar uh, to share your, uh, your questions with us. You can do this in two ways. Um, on the chat, so there's a chat that um, if you look at the barn, I think it'll be on your right hand side, I have to double check that, uh, you're able to pop a question into the chat. And um, I believe, and Alan will confirm this, um, uh, that we are able to uh, also take questions verbally, that you're able to also talk and ask questions. Yes, that's yeah. right. Okay, and um, in order to do that, you have a you can unmute yourself and ask a question. So feel free to to ask questions either which way, either through the chat or through unmuting yourself and ask and and just and maybe share your experiences if you are already engaged in community based work similar to this. I'd love to know more about what you're doing. I'm keeping I'm keeping my eye. Okay. Uh, for any raised hands, nothing so far. Maybe everyone's a bit shy, <laughs> but you can also share your question. There we go. Okay, let's see. Nelly. Okay, mm -hmm. Nelly, I am um, going to unmute you, Nelly. Okay. Nelly, go ahead. Uh, good evening. How are you, everyone? It's lovely sharing this easy uh, session. Um, I'm a chef, right? And I care for uh, elderly with all sorts of um, 
conditions, uh, especially in space, yeah, we are talking about now. Yeah, and um, I've gone through some challenges before I understood what it really mean um, to have someone who has got a condition like that until um, I had a session at my workplace to show me how to go about it. And until now, <clears throat> there's still some mixed um, ideas among people, especially when we um, we are doing the um, moist and um, what do you call it? There's a name for it, proper name. <laughs> The minced and moist? Minced and moist, yes. Thank you very much. Minced mm -hmm. and moist. Some people, they intend to say, let's say, it, when it is meat, right? Mm -hmm. It should be minced and moist, and you should uh, look for vegetables, which are soft as well. You should use the meat as a chunk meat to, as, let's say, it's level six. So that means you need to use um, carrot, then you cut it 1.5 uh, millimeters. Mm -hmm. That is um, so that when they're chewing, they've got that level of like, they want to feel that they are chewing something. Mm -hmm. Now, the confusion is, because it should be minced and moist, people, they, we, we intend to put um, too much pureed meat, then that means it will be like, porridge soaked into lumps and it doesn't look appetizing as well because what we forget is these people they've got condition but they eat as well like normal human beings you eat with your eyes first so presentation is the most important key for them so that we encourage them to eat but my question is do we purify the meat and it means the moist. The percentage of meat, we moist the vegetables, for example, mushrooms, which is soft, uh, or carrots, which is easy to chew as well. Is it enough in terms of protein? So, okay, so there's, um, just in terms of the, the question around nutrition, I'm, I'm not the best person to answer that because I don't come from a nutrition background. But, but perhaps maybe I can respond to the two other issues that you raised that are interrelated. Um, the, um, the, que the question, the broad query around um, looking at the size, of course, yes, size, the particle size is important. So following the ITSI guideline on that is, is useful. There's a, a, the, the mixing of a puree with a uh, minced um, size particle is, um, is up for discussion. Okay, so I think uh, my main response to that is depending on what this person has prescribed as an appropriate um, diet level, um, whether, whether a mixed consistency, because that would classify as a mixed consistency for me, a minced and a pureed is going to be acceptable for them. So I think I would first run that by the person who's prescribed the diet uh, texture to have a look at how that, that will literally work for the person. Um, what I liked mostly, and this is the other issue you raised, uh, is is the the reference to that people eat with their eyes. And thank you for raising that, because uh, I really think it's important and and great that as a chef, uh, your your focus on looking at eating and the experience, the, the hedonic nature, the pleasure we have associated with eating is really critical. Um, oftentimes, as someone working from within a healthcare perspective. I get seduced by the fatality issue and the fact that this might be a problem for the person so much so that we almost, and initially I, I, I remember when I first started working in dysphagia, um, that that the focus was so much on on, on the actual texture per se, that, that the, um, the way in which food was presented, the fact that it looked like a gray mushy mess was almost incidental. Yeah. Uh, fact that, so I think that, that it's great that you're looking at the visual. Um, and, I'd, and I'd like to also say that there's a huge, and that's why um, mm -hmm. our focus now looking at multi-sensory eating is, is, is important because the visual does matter more than, than from a pure pleasure perspective, also from the fact that it gets people ready 
to do things with their body when they see a particular size of food and, and recognize shape and understand what this is going to be doing when, when it approaches their mouths. So 10 out of 10 for focusing on the visual and thank you for raising that. Okay. I'm not sure if there's thank anyone else in the much. audience who's from a nutrition background that can assist with the nutrition um, query that, you, that you've had. If there is anyone who'd like to chip in, feel free. Uh, there's n there are no raised hands right now, but there is a question that came in that says, okay. if you don't have someone at home to help you, mm -hmm. are you training the person with dysphagia to modify their diets? How are you training the person with dysphagia to modify their diets if you don't have someone oh. at home to help? Okay. So that's a that's a uh, tough question, and I think predominantly we so we in my experience, um, not an unrealistic one to ask either. So most people with disabilities will live at, um, under some kind of care system, okay? Uh, and here I'm not looking only at a high income country care system, but also obviously looking at a low or middle income context where for example, there may be a sibling or a parent or a spouse or someone that uh, has a connection with this person with disability. So oftentimes they, 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 and it depends on the nature of the disability, but they're not often left alone. And there's often some kind of familial uh, community link that happens uh, where people, even if they are at home for extended periods of time alone, may have food preparation, uh, the responsibility of food preparation taken over by their caregiver. Mm -hmm. so, so, so first and foremost, the training that I spoke about um, in, in the presentation was targeting that population, targeting the primary caregivers, targeting people who may be closely associated with the food preparation themselves. But your question is a good one because in terms of shifting, and this is a, a largely uh, Western Eurocentric perspective of independence. So looking at the nature, so within a rehabilitation framework, um, most Western or Euro, uh, Eurocentric programs um, focus on making the person as independent as possible. And there's, uh, there's value in doing that, but many cultures around the world um, believe in a communal sense of belonging uh, and, a, and, and, and rehabilitation in that sense almost always takes care or takes into account that care environment. Um, but in the, in the unusual case where there are individuals taking care of themselves, um, and I suppose because of my own background in speech and language therapy, understanding the nature of communication, the cognitive, the social, the, um, the whole way in which people um, might need to understand what you're teaching is what I would take into account. So I would, for example, and when we've done this in the past, so this is based on my experience, my clinical experience, we've done things like uh, the use of uh, picture uh, communication, so almost alternative communication aids, so an augmentative, uh, like a picture board, explaining how it is you might um, prepare a meal. Uh, so we'd have actual photographs. I remember the one year we, we went around photo, um, uh, photographing with our cell phones a whole range of different foods that people may take from, uh, from, the, from the whole version of it through to how you might um, prepare it by chopping, et cetera. So yes, those sorts of things are what I would take into account for various levels of not just um, communication abilities, but also um, even with literacy levels as well. So, so that's part of what I might do is uh, to, if I'm working within that framework of uh, a, a sort of a strong framework of independence, then that's what I might do. Um, I hope that's answered your question in part. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to take it further if you'd like to add more to it. Sally, thank you for your question. If you'd like to send a follow-up, you can use the Q&A function or uh, raise your hand uh, and you can have a one-on-one, -on -one, Dr. Pillay. Uh, for now, uh, while we wait for more questions, I am going to include uh, your email in the chat for folks to mm -hmm. communicate with you. Um, and there we go. Thank you. So that's where you can and, reach Marjorie yeah. Pillay. Um, so I think while, while, while also you may be thinking about questions, what I'd like to do is to, to um, find out from the people that are on the chat, if at all possible, how many of you are actually working in community and um, what your thoughts are on implementing ITC at community level. So if there are people who are currently engaged in that, I'd love to learn a little bit from your own experiences. Great. While we do that, we have another question from Elisa, Elisa, I'm going to unmute you. 
Oops. There we there we go, Lisa. Go ahead. Hi, right, Lisa. There we go. I, I think you can hear me now. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm calling from California. I am a dietitian working in nursing homes and I write menus. Okay. Instead, I'm finding the IDDSI many uh, diets particularly challenging because we have varying skills and production, et cetera. Um, one of my questions, the mist and moist seems pretty direct. When I get to the bite size and such, I find that the guidelines say if I can mash the meat, I'm finding with the limited skills of cooks, that's not very feasible. So I am having them grind the meats. Does that seem appropriate or do you have a better suggestion? Because I cannot trust that they cook the meats till moist and tender. Uh, Lisa, I'm sorry, I lost connectivity for a second and I heard. Okay, are you still there? Hang on here. Um, hang on here. I'm I am can you repeat it? Okay, uh, can you hear me? I oh. can, yes. Okay, I'm getting in and out. Okay. For the um bite-sized diet. Um, the guideline under IDDSI is that you can serve either a mashable meat or, you know, and I mean, that's the guideline. I'm finding that I cannot trust that meats will be cooked to a mashable state. So I am giving the guideline of grinding the meat. Do you have any suggestions on how to make <laughs> proof on that? Um, look, I, th I think I'm going to say that if we prescribe diet at that level, then we, wouldn't, we should be developing um, a recipe that obviously um, develops, uh, you know, de delivers on the product. But I totally understand where you're coming from and how difficult it is to synchronize the communication from the intended product through what actually is delivered. Correct. Um, so, so, uh, have very, some of them have very limited skills in reality. Okay. So, so, that, so that's why in, in terms of focusing on uh, community sort of interpretation and use of it's you know, just one of the things that we spoke a lot, um, that the training program I focus on does more of, it focuses more on teaching people about textural properties, what, what are these things, and then um, also more on food preparation rather than just classification. So if you equip people with enough knowledge to make the food uh, and know why they're making it, then I'm really of the firm belief that actually will affect the change that you want to happen in the kitchens. Yeah. Uh, for many years, I worked in the hospital, um, uh, and the one place I worked in, uh, which was a 10 year long stint, it took at least about the first year and a bit to get kitchen um, dietitian, speech therapy, caregivers involved, to all understand at a, literally at a granular level what that meant. But I, I appreciate how long it might take for an institution to shift. But for me, I'm going to promote the idea that knowledge is power and that the more people know about what they're doing with the foods geologically, the textural properties that they shift in, and then uh, enough about how to prepare that food, the skill is in the preparation. Uh, and then finally, when they get to measure it, they have a clear image, a sense of what, what is needed. So, so I'm going to say reinvest in that um, group of people you're working with, that invest not only in the classification, more in the preparation and in the knowledge of what, what are these textual properties we are shifting about. So, so now, and I'll give you maybe a little bit from my own experience that, that seemed to help, was um, in in instead of focusing purely on the, the as you described, say a mashable uh, meat, okay? The idea was well, what would happen if you cooked chicken thigh versus chicken breast uh, versus lamb versus beef in a particular way? How would you need to make it so that it becomes that mashable texture or the texture that you can use with the side of the fork and, and, and easily slice through it like a bit of butter? And, and that for me was the biggest skill is learning how to understand that from the point of view of the food 
and the method. Uh, and so experimenting with recipes, working with kitchen very closely on, on actually developing that and making the perfect recipe for each of those different commonly used meats or whatever foods you might uh, might be using. Okay, hope that's you. Sally. Uh, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a couple more questions and then we'll have to finish up our session. So I'm just gonna move on. Mm -hmm. um, Mary says, I'm an SLP who works with adults with intellectual and physical disabilities. Most of the population is on a mixed textured diet. For example, period meat with ground all else. Any suggestions on how to introduce the kitchen staff on the ITSI framework? Uh, yes, huge uh, amount of suggestion here. So first pit stop would be to actually look at the wonderful resources that are available on the Etsy website, if you haven't already. Uh, there's really a huge amount of uh, guidelines and um, literally very um, teaching information. So PowerPoints, uh, vid teaching videos, and a whole range of other resources that are all downloadable and can be used as part of a training program. In fact, that's that's the those are the sets of resources that are used to train people in 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 this rural community I talked about early on. Uh, so so quite a useful set of information that is already there that's been designed, developed for almost calibrated for use, um, and you just need to acknowledge the source of it. So that's the first thing I uh, I would recommend is is uh, using that. But um, the, the framework for implementation that ITSI um, advertised and developed um, at the beginning is also a useful one to, to start investigating um, and, and, and implementing in a staged manner. One of the biggest things that I found useful in implementing ITSI at not just institutional level, but uh, I suppose you could consider community institution as well, but at community level, uh, was to look at how we educate and how we approach that education uh, for implementation. And you may remember that in my talk, I cross-referenced um, principles of adult learning and andragogy. And there's a technical, traditionally we tend to teach down to people, and I know this is not true for everyone, but we tend to have a chalk and talk attitude to how we educate people with, uh, within a system. And what shifted me a lot is going into a conversation with a team, so people who are catering or the, the chefs and the cooks, whoever they are, and, and literally asking them what they do, okay, and how they, so, so essentially starting off from learning from the people we're working with, because not only will they surprise you in terms of the amazing solutions they have on their own, uh, but also it will be a useful way of knowing how to pitch um, your education strategy and how to engage people in the learning process. So it becomes genuinely a reciprocal learning experience and becomes useful for shifting what it is you're doing in the institution. So, so number one, look at all the amazing resources that are available. Number two, engage the people that you are working with in a more meaningful conversation if, if you're not already. Uh, towards looking at how you can share your knowledges and how you can develop the system together, uh, that it's not you telling this shared responsibility. Hope that's useful. Alan, is there another question? Yes, uh, we have a question and from have Emily. Yeah, just real quick. Emily is asking, uh, have you been able to implement this mm -hmm. at daycares and nursing homes, especially home gardens and Emily is in New Zealand and Mershon maybe before I let you answer I, I can because I am involved with all the webinars so I know that uh, this question has come in before and there are webinars available through our website mm -hmm. and through our YouTube channel which I just posted the link on the chat uh, that talk exactly about very specifically about implementing this uh, ITSI the ITSI framework in nursing home so uh, Emily my recommendation mm -hmm would be spend some time there, uh, look at all the resources. As, as Mershon already said, there is a whole variety of videos and posters that are free to download uh, um, as long as they're cited properly. <laughs> but um, you're not working alone. Mm -hmm. There are people doing this work and, and, uh, and some of this stuff has been already figured out. So my invitation would be, please go out, check out re our resources. Um, okay. okay. Lovely response there. Thanks. <laughs> That's great. Um, and maybe uh, this, 
And this is the, the lovely Emily Jones from New Zealand, who I know. Maybe we can chat offline more about that. Uh, but just a quick addition to what you said, Ellen, uh, that, that working with uh, daycare centers and home gardens specifically, yes, I have, and they've worked beautifully because you're working through a community structure that can share with community. Uh, and so there's strategies, if you're interested in, in talking about that, I can connect with you after the, the, the webinar. That's awesome. Okay. okay, we've reached the top of the hour. Thank you everyone for joining us and for joining Dr. Pillay in today's session. Uh, we have two more coming up. Um, so if you liked what you saw, please spread the word. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so we have one upcoming on the 11th of November and 18th of November, and you can find the registration details on our website. Uh, but thank you again, uh, Mershon, for spending some time with us. And thank you everyone for attending and I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us everyone. Bye.